Hello everyone, it's a real pleasure to be here today to talk about um, our collections and what we do. So, just a quick introduction. So I'm going to be talking about our service and the way that we work with our academic colleagues in the school in promoting our collections and we've actually changed our focus quite a lot recently in terms of our dissemination activities so I'll be touching on that as well and thinking about new and innovative ways that we're trying to promote our collections. So I don't feel as innovative as an escape room, which I saw yesterday <laughs> and other things, but this is what, what we're doing at the school in, in a small scale and with limited resources. So there's three events I'm going to talk about, um, which are listed here, and these really all focus on different audiences. So we've worked with school children, our internal stakeholders of staff and students, and then the general public as well. So just a little bit about the archive service. So this is the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in Keppel Street in London. And it's a postgraduate medical school and its mission is to improve health worldwide. The archive service was established 15 years ago, um, started from a one person operation, me, um, and we've grown over the years. So we've got, um, there's a team of five of us now, um, but many of us work part time. So I think it's about 3.2 equivalent people. Um, we, as was said, archives, records management, information compliance, I'm heavily involved in GDPR preparation at the moment, image management and research data management. So we cover ourselves quite thin quite a lot of the time. And as well as the Ross collection, which I'll speak about in the moment, we have collections on HIV and AIDS, nutrition and map collection, as well as the administrative, administrative records of the institution. So in terms of dissemination, we've always tried to disseminate um, about our collections and promote them as much as possible. We're often restricted by resources. I said we're a very small team and we cover ourselves, um, we cover lots of different areas. So we often have to take quite a strategic approach to what we take part in and I'll talk a little bit about, more about that later. We struggled in the past to attract large audiences um, and although I say our stakeholders are our staff and students, our students actually do MSCs um, in health-related subjects, so they're not history students. There is a small number of students, about 15 a year, that do a health and history and health module, but our main users and researchers are not our students, so we are trying to kind of work with them, but knowing that they're not really going to come and use the archives in the time that they're studying at the school. So when we do events, we will get students come to them, but they're interested from more of a personal point of view than actually it will help their research. So we used to hold these things called Gems from the Collections, um, which there's a couple of examples here. Um, what we felt here was we were kind of getting material out at lunchtime and showing it to people. Um, we were often behind a desk, it wasn't that interactive, and people were very um, appreciative of, the, of seeing some of the archives, but the comments we got were more kind of like, oh, I really like this old stuff, rather than any um, kind of following up. It was all quite anecdotal, and I know that's been a theme of the conference about how we kind of evaluate and work why we're um, doing these sessions. So often we were like, oh, we're due to do a GEMS, but we weren't really thinking about why we were doing it. What we've also found difficult, and this is obviously a theme for people that have scientific and medical and um, technology archives, is to convey the scientific impacts um, and use the correct terminology to non-historians, maybe scientists. As I said, often they go, oh, I love all this old stuff, but it was really, we wanted to get across the point of why we're collecting it, why we hold it, why we're preserving it and making it accessible to them. So that's a real kind of sticking point sometimes that has been mentioned in past STAG meetings as well. How do we get enough knowledge and expertise so we can convey the importance of this material? We want to show that it's relevant to their work, the archives that we have, but also promote the message that they need to manage their collections properly so that they can come to the archives, either through the records management service or um, other ways, for the future, so we keep collecting um, the material. Um, there's another couple of pictures there. We'd also put up exhibitions, but you see they're quite flat, and often we weren't there kind of to talk about the material. So although we're promoting the archives, there, again, wasn't much kind of comeback from that. I feel that we have been try to be quite innovative in the past as well in other ways. So there's two pictures here from an event called Archives Alive. So I worked with two actors and we created a script um, based around three women scientists. Um, these were women that, again, women's history, um, there's not that many, if you like, um, 
I was going to say important, not important, but um, prominent women kind of figures in the history of the school. It's very male dominated. But through research in the archives, we found out more of the women maybe that were, went on expeditions with their husbands and did very important work and so forth. And um, maybe there's, we have letters from someone who did an adventure, invention about a mosquito helmet. So we worked with some actors and we gave this performance. So you can see there's actually, in terms of numbers, there's not many people um, there, but we did um, present it as a podcast as well to try and promote it to a further audience. And then archivists' favourite subject, cake. So we do um, something called the Great War Bake Off. And we do this, we've just done the fourth one last week. And this came from an idea when we had a war and health exhibition in 2014 to commemorate the start of the First World War. In our Ministry of Food collection, in our nutrition collection, we have Second World War recipes. Um, so we did a baking competition, which staff and students can enter. And we have the head of catering and the head of nutrition actually judging this competition. So we're trying to work with different ways, promoting the collections. But I'm going to move on to talk about um, the, the three projects that we've worked on in the last year. This is Sir Ronald Ross. Um, his collection is the largest that we hold. It has over 20,000 items, obviously normal stuff, correspondence, photographs, reports. And he's obviously very important in terms of malaria because he was the discoverer of the mosquito transmission of malaria. And he was the first Briton to win the Nobel Prize for medicine. He's very close to my heart because I actually catalogued his papers. We had a Wellcome Trust um, grant in 2003. So I've read all, um, not all, but most of um, his papers. So he is um, dear to my heart. And what's interesting about him is Although he made this amazing discovery, he was also a prominent figure in kind of history. In terms of um, life and society, he was friends with Roger Kipling, H.G. Wells, because he was a poet and a writer and an artist, but also new politicians and so forth. So his collection is very rich in scientific material, but also other material. But what's been nice in the projects I'm going to talk about is kind of promoting his discovery in more depth. So the first project um, is, this is Ailey Robinson, um, the lady with ginger hair, and she is a PhD student. And she actually approached us um, last year. She'd received a public engagement grant from the school and really wanted to work with um, us and a group of school children about um, diagnostics and using microscopes. So it was a project with local school children to look at um, using microscopes for diagnostics. So part of the project was use this full, full scope microscope. So her aim was to promote and use these. It's a paper microscope, which only costs $1 to produce. And it really encourages people to use microscopes um, and look at the microscopic word or the microcosmos, which was a new term to me when I um, got involved. So she worked the session, which she ran three at the school in the original labs, as you'll see. Um, was to create this origami microscope and they'd use it and they actually looked at the um, malaria infected brain sections. Um, and also, they, as you can see, they can be connected to smartphones so that she really felt that that would kind of connect with the teenagers. But she really wanted to have a historical element to the project as well, which is where we got involved and really show how researchers in the past had used microscopes and the fact that major discoveries such as the mosquito transmission of malaria had only been made possible with the use of microscopes. What I quite like um, is the fact that Ross also um, designed his own diagnostic microscope because the ones um, that we have, and you can see here, that was too large to travel around with. So there's a really nice parallel that they're looking at um, portable microscopes to do diagnosis in the field, and that's what Sir Ronald Ross did. So there's some great pictures here of the school children looking at our material from the archives. But what was also really important is that staff got to look at the archives. And these are staff that we don't necessarily come into contact with through other kind of areas that we work in. So these events are really good at building our profile, getting more staff engaged with the archives. And it's kind of proved um, true recently because we had an accession from one of these um, ladies, Claire Rogers, which included blood slides from 1914. They're moving labs and we're like, oh, we've just found this material. It would have been nice if they'd thought of us before. But I really feel like the, kind of we're building momentum. Um, with this, so it was nice that um, they got involved with this. Working with PhD students, and this is something I will come back to, but Ailey, the student, um, wrote in a blog post, um, she said, running sessions like these can sometimes seem like a lot of arguably unnecessary work, 
provide the benefit to the students by providing means to which to explore the microscopic world and generate a discussion and interest on the topic of disease diagnosis. They also benefited the scientists who led the sessions. Public engagement projects like these allowed myself and colleagues to hone our ability to explain scientific concepts without jargon and overcomplication. I found that learning to deliver presentations that can hold the attention of school children have served me extremely well as an academic presenting to my peers. And I think there's lots of parallels with archivists. I think, again, themes in the conference have come um, up about not using jargon and, and trying to promote to kind of different audiences. So I thought that was quite interesting that um, as a PhD student trying to do um, similar things in public engagement that archivists do, that they kind of face some of the same issues. So I'm now going to move on to talk about an event for our internal audience. So this is um, History in the Making, where slides explored and explained. We ran the session last week as part of Explore Your Archives, and that was the second time we'd run the session. So this is a box of Ross blood slides, um, which we travelled with and obviously used um, diagnosis. And in 2015, students from the History and Health module, um, as I said, there's about kind of 14 of them a year, suggested that we put Ross's slides, collection of malaria slides, under the microscope. Um, we're a little bit nervous about this because obviously there's the preservation versus access argument and, you know, um, we were kind of quite unsure. But because this suggestion had come from a student and they were really, really keen on this, we thought, right, well, we'll, we'll choose one and we'll actually, we'll do it. So it was a bit out of our comfort zone. So these are the photographs um, that were taken of the blood slides. So we got um, colleagues, including Ailey from the last project, um, and staff from the Public Health Malaria um, Research Reference Laboratory. Um, and they examined these slides under the microscope, um, decided that they were still viable, and presented some really exciting results. Um, they were really excited about the staining techniques um, they use something called a gentian violet, which has changed considerably since the 19th century. Um, but you can see, and this is where <laughs> it proves my point, the oocysts and the gamocytes, this is where my medical kind of knowledge ends, um, were seen. So these were photographed by the laboratory, and we had these on show at the event that we ran. But what was really lovely was that the staff were so excited about the results, but they're actually more excited about the staining methods than the actual um, oocysts and gamocytes, um, the kind of malaria stages. And I think, again, there were um, similarities with the archives profession. I know maybe book conservators get excited about the binding of books, and maybe some of us get excited about the arrangement of a collection. So I think it was kind of interesting to see they, I'd assumed that they'd be excited about Kind of the content rather than the kind of method. So I thought that was um, that was a really kind of interesting part of this project. So this is the event. Um, <coughs> so we had staff and students. I think we had roughly about 80 people come during a lunchtime session to come and look at the material that we'd got out. So we had our academic colleagues, um, scientific colleagues, you can see, showing people the actual blood slides and talking about them while uh, myself and my colleagues were talking about the rare books and the archives and so we gave a really nice rounded event in terms of there were people that could talk about the scientific discovery and then there was us that could talk more about Ross and his life and so forth. And another kind of um, first was this was a visiting kind of academic who suddenly said, oh, I could make that microscope work. So we got his mobile phone out with a light and just started kind of fiddling around with it. And again, we were slightly unsure about this because we're like people, don't, you don't normally touch the archives. But we kind of got caught up in his enthusiasm. So we actually got the microscope working and you know, other staff and students could actually look through the microscope and see some of the slides. So again, it's that preservation preservation versus access kind of argument. You know, we didn't want to stop him because he was so enthusiastic and it's really nice to get that um, interaction with our users. So from this year's event, we've had really good feedback from the staff members that came. And again, they're really keen to do more outreach. And some of the um, staff that work in the labs don't get a chance to do this sort of outreach. So um, they're keen to get involved in, with more of the historical collections. So the final event I'm going to talk about is um, the Cheltenham Science Festival. So I'd like to think as a result of the um, previous two projects that this is how this came about. So the public engagement officer said, would we like to be involved in a session at the Cheltenham Science Festival? Um, I will warn you in a minute, the photos aren't quite as good quality as the ones which were taken by a professional photographer. You'll see what I mean in a minute. But the title of the session was The Story of the Mosquito. It was split into three parts. Um, and the idea of the talk was to give an overview of the story of malaria, highlighting Ross's importance, 
but also how scientists are using his methods, um, the, the methods he used in his original discovery today. Um, so I started off the talk um, speaking about his discovery and then using, highlighting it with material from the archives. You can see there's a selection of the, the um, material I used there. And then Ailey Robinson, um, who appears in all of these events, um, she took over for me and spoke a little bit about Ross and made a really nice link between um, Ross and someone called Sir Malcolm Watson, who did a lot of malaria work in the 1950s in our education programme in Malaya. But then she spoke about her research methods of her, her current PhD. Okay. Um, so that was really nice to hear more about her research methods. And then finally, Will Stone, who's a PhD student, um, carried on about new research linking back to Ross's transmission cycle discovery and how scientists still look at the original transmission of malaria and try and find weak points in it. What I really liked about working with the PhD students is that I learned a lot about their current research um, and just the way that they work was really interesting. It was really nice to have three people kind of responsible for the event as well in terms of, um, again, coming back to this jargon-free um, and how you promote your collections and how you talk about your collections because they were using quite scientific terms that I was like, well, I'm not quite sure about that. And then they were saying to me, maybe less is more in terms of when you're talking about Ross because I can talk for England about Ross because I know so much about him. Um, so what was also nice about the event is that we got to take the archives out, which we never do, um, and put a display on for um, people to come and look. So we added another dimension to the event, as did um, a live mosquito dissection, which Ailey there did um, in front of everyone. So conclusions and benefits. Um, I think really the improved working relationship with academic colleagues, as I've pointed out, it's been really useful in raising our profile, getting more accessions in, people asking us for advice, you can tell I'm responsible for records management and other areas, so it's all kind of, they come to me for lots of different areas, but it's nice if they're like, oh, well, I saw you at that event, but can I talk to you about my current records? So that's been really, really useful. Um, it's also nice to know, and this has come up in the conference, that we're at kind of our expertise and our knowledge, um, maybe other people that work in academic settings sometimes, but within professional services, sometimes you sometimes have to prove yourself a bit, and you're like, I do know what I'm talking about. This is what I do. Um, you're an expert in malaria, but I'm kind of an expert in, in archives. Um, improved working relationship with our public engagement officer, and as I said, I think as the relationship grows, more um, opportunities will come along yep. um, to work on different, different projects, which will be really nice. Increased visibility of the archive service to new and existing audiences. I think sometimes when we're all really busy and we're getting on, and I've worked there, I set up the archives, I've worked there 15 years, and I'm thinking, oh, well, that person's been here 20 years. They must know about the archive service, but I'm continually surprised when maybe some people don't know as much as I kind of think they would and assume they would. So I think there's a need to do constant um, kind of reassessing of what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, and then supporting the work of our main stakeholder. As was said, we were recently awarded accreditation and we did lots of work on, on evaluation and supporting the school and who are our main stakeholders. One thing we have done, um, is think about a kind of, it's a decision tree about what events we take on. I think in the past, we were so excited if someone said, oh, do you want to do an event? We'd be like, yeah, of course we do it. And then we hadn't looked at resources and time. And, and so now we're a little bit more stricter with ourselves of like, should we be doing this? So that accreditation really helped us in kind of um, honing that down. I did want to add one note, because when I went through this with my colleague back in London, she was just like, can you stop being quite so positive and just say that these events have been great, but they do take a lot of time and a lot of resources and can, sometimes can be quite stressful. So just put that out there, which I'm, I know you'll all be aware of, but I don't want to look like I'm um, too positive. It's improved our knowledge of the collection and subject matter, and I've really felt that, especially with Cheltenham. I did a lot of research on the actual kind of how we made this discovery, which I had known a long time ago, but had kind of got lost somewhere. So now I have an academic talk to me about malaria, I'm, I feel more comfortable in saying, well, I can take your collection because then we've got this, and, and it just helps sometimes to reconnect with that collection. And then finally, it's a very satisfying and rewarding experience. It, it, was, it was lovely to go to Cheltenham and get out of the office, as it's been lovely to come here, and it's lovely um, to maybe work with different colleagues, have different conversations, and just sometimes it really reconnects you with your archives and, and why you do what you do. So I think... Um, I will end there because I'm being uh, before the one minute. So yes, so that's the end.
So thank you.